Bergsonism is Hegelianism in reverse. Hegelianism is panlogism, that is, everything is the idea. Pan in Greek means all. So logos means word. So everything is the idea. Bergsonism, however, is absolute anti-intellectualism. So it, it is totally the reverse. It, it is, uh, uh, well, we'll see. Hegel reduces that which is de facto to that which must be since all facts proceed necessarily from the evolutionary idea. So if it exists, it must be because it has been willed by the zeitgeist. Bergsonism, on the other hand, reduces that which must be to that which is de facto. For Hegel, something succeeds because it is moral, that is, willed by the idea. For Bergson, something is moral because it succeeds. You have to think about that a little bit. Le Roi, our life is an incessant creation. The same is true for the world. For this reason, immanence and transcendence are no longer contradictory. The immanence means, well, it means that something is in something else. So it re usually refers to God. So if, some, if God is immanent, that means he is identified with the world. If he is transcendent, it means that he lives in a different order. From the world, that there are two orders, a created and uncreated order. God is transcendent because he is in the uncreated order. So those are two things that are contradictory. He says, no, that's no longer true. They correspond to two distinct moments of duration. Immanence corresponds to what has become, and transcendence corresponds to what is becoming. If we say that God is imminent, it is that we know uh, of him what he has become in us and in the world. But for us and for the world, there remains always an infinite to become, an infinite which will be creation properly so called, not simply development. And from this point of view, God appears as transcendent. And it is as transcendent that we must always treat God in our relations with him according to what we have recognized concerning the divine personality. So, God is becoming in us. In other words, Garrigou says that in Hegel, the world becomes God. It's the divinization of the world. And in Bergson, it's the exact opposite. God becomes the world. Ah. It's the divinized, in that sense, it, it, it's the de divinization of God. It's the, the worldization of God or the secularization of God. And Bergsonism is the very spirit of the Novus Ordo. It's imminentism.
That's why you have folk masses. I don't think they even do folk masses. Or, you know, just all of this liturgical garbage that they do. That's all part of this. That the, that, uh, the, the human becomes divine. In other words, it, it, is, it is a divinization of the human. Whereas the, all of the traditional liturgy is extremely transcendent. It is bellowing the two orders in everything. Architecture, language, music, incense, vestments, decoration of the altar, ceremonies, everything is bellowing transcendence of God. Higher order, supernatural order. The Novus Ordo is bellowing God is part of the natural order. So the the you know it's virtue for in the in the traditional spirituality it's virtue for the priest to manifest his uh, supernaturality, you might say. And the more supernatural he is, the better the priest he is. That's why the Protestant man said, I, I have just met, concerning the Curie of Ars, I have just met God in a man. It was a comment that a Protestant made. I have just met God in a man. That's the ideal of the priesthood. Whereas the ideal of the priesthood in the Novus Ordo is to be one of the guys. Father Jack. To be dressed like a slob. Shorts and a sweatshirt and sneakers. That's the ideal of the priesthood. To show yourself as more human. And so the Novus Ordoites all love their priests because they're great guys. He's just a great guy. You hear this all the time. All the time. I, I'm on planes, you know. Oh, yeah, you, you know. I mean, you say you're a Catholic priest. Oh, I'm from San Bernardino in California. Do you know Father so-and-so? Oh, you know, I live in Florida. You know, they, he's 3,000 miles away. How would I, I, that's what I feel like saying. How would I possibly know somebody 3,000 miles away? And, and uh, so, uh, and then, Inevitably, we really like him. He's a great guy. And it just, you know, oh, you know, it's, uh, okay, thank you. Know, let's move on. Uh, it's true. And then you get stories about how he's a great guy. You know, he does all the various things that are just purely human. That's key to understanding the Novus Ordo and key to understanding how it differs from the Catholic faith. So I remember in my modernist seminary, one of the stained glass windows had a, a picture of uh, somebody playing basketball because the seminarians play basketball. See, so when you're playing basketball, God is evolving in you. You're, you're, it's that becoming, you know. And the, 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 the human is divinized. Uh, then the, it's, uh, for the offertory procession, some of the athletes would bring up their uh, jerseys and their sneakers. It's... You know, the procession, they have the, you know, like the basketball jersey or something. That's the shirt, you know, and the, the sneakers. <laughs> and then they even had garbage masses where they would bring up garbage cans at the offertory. They would. I mean, I'm not kidding you.
See, and then the whole thing with relaxing all of the seminary rules and rules of religious life, uh, clerical garb, forget it, because that's supernatural order. That means you're something different. You're not human. You're some sort of non-human thing, you know, because you have a cassock on. So you have to get rid of that. So you wear secular clothes. The nuns get into secular clothes. And instead of observing silence, which is a condition of prayer, uh, you talk the whole day, you see, and you find God in each other. I remember that. This is what they told us. They said to us, you have to become more human, and you have to find God in other people. So we used to kid, you know, well, should we genuflect in front of somebody else because, you know, finding God in him? Is he like the tabernacle? This was in the 1960s. I mean, I lived this. You know, this is not something I'm making up or anything like that or heard. I lived it. This is what we were told. I thought it was a lot of garbage at the time. So, but that, that is, it's Bergson. It, that, that's, uh, uh, in that sense, he's had a tremendous influence. <clears throat> for Hegel, the world becomes God. For Bergson, God becomes the world. This incarnation of God in the world prevalent in Bergsonian philosophy will heavily influence theological thinking in the 20th century. It will take on a Christian overtone by the creation of a cosmic Christ. That's Teilhard de Chardin. where Christ becomes the meeting place of God and all humanity, an incarnate humanity, J JP2. This is also known as incarnational theology. Father uh, Desposito will talk to you about that in the modern, the third part of modern errors. That's JP2. God uh, connected himself to the whole human race uh, and redeemed the whole human race through the incarnation. So everyone is part of Christ. You see, the whole world is part of Christ. Whereas the Catholic theology is that you become incorporated in Christ by baptism, sanctifying grace, which requires faith first, the act of faith. But if you see Redemptor Hominis, which is the first encyclical of JP2 that's in there. And, you know, it sounds nice, you know. It's a, you know oh, one, you know. And, and uh, it's, it's a horrid error. Denies the supernatural order. And Garrigo says, if you read his De Revelazione, that that is the the central problem in in modern theology is the denial of the supernatural order, the mixture of the two orders. That's exactly what this is. Well, then there was uh, when now Cardinal Dolan became the Bishop of Milwaukee, Archbishop of Milwaukee. He wore a cheese hat for his installation. In Wisconsin, they make a lot of cheese. So one of the, the cultural, uh, let's say, adornments is to wear a cheese hat in Wisconsin. It looks like a piece of cheese that's sitting on your head. A you know, big piece of cheese. And so he wore a cheese hat. That's so typically Novus Ordo. Yes. <laughs> no. Uh, and then when he became the Archbishop of New York, he said he wouldn't wear red socks. I mean, when he became a cardinal, because of the Boston Red Sox. For those of you who do not know what the Boston Red Sox are, they are a baseball team. The baseball team of Boston. So Boston is a city. And their baseball team is called the Red Sox. 
Sock is a, it's a it spells X, but it means S O C K S, your sock that you wear. Chaussette in French. All right, so he didn't, the, you know, you're supposed to wear red socks if you are a cardinal. Okay. So he said he would not wear red socks because of the Boston Red Sox. He's supposed to be rooting for the Yankees, which is the New York team. Uh, all of these absurdities, uh, uh, you know, this degradation of the uh, of the office of cardinal, et cetera, it is uh, it's all part of that that whole system. See, he's more human. And then people in the pews laugh and oh yeah, he's, yeah it's really funny. You won't wear uh, you know, red socks because of the Boston Red Sox. See, he's more human, so that's virtue. So you have to understand that. Yeah, you, know, you have to grasp what what is the soul of the Novus Ordo. So that said, now we get into materialistic evolutionism. This also has been a, a, a tremendously strong and bad influence on the modern world. Uh, Darwin and Heckel. You see, evolutionism became the fad in the 19th century. Everything was evolution because of Hegel. Hegel ha has had a tremendous influence. And the reason why evolutionism, well, first of all, it's metaphysically absurd because it means that you, it's based on the principle that you go from a lower form of life to a higher form, say like from a fish to a frog, therefore something metaphysically higher without a sufficient cause. You cannot make that jump from lower to higher without a sufficient cause. You need some creative cause to go from lower to higher. You don't get something from nothing, in other words. But that's based on getting something from nothing. And it's absurd, no matter what other things you want to say about it. It's absurd for that reason. So you know, the idea that the fish looks at the shore and thinks, I want to you know, walk on the shore, and then it eventually gets legs after a billion years of this. And if you need another billion, throw it in. Throw in five billion, and you'll get it. Those legs will come out, and they'll start... <laughs> Jumping around, you know, doesn't matter how many billions you need, trillions if you need. So I mean, that that's, and then the the uh, it's theologically destructive because it uh, ruins the most fundamental notion uh, of religion, which is creation. Man is dependent upon God because God is the creator. Even if you're a pagan, you can figure that out. It is the most basic religious thought. Even before revelation, even if God had never revealed himself, that's the most basic thought of religion. I am dependent upon God because he is the creator, I am the creature. It destroys that. So it would be good for you over your, your long lives 
to you know, study responses to evolutionism because I call it the modern mythology. We laugh at the Romans, you know, for horses with wings and gods and goddesses and all sorts of mythical creatures. That it looks like, you know, uh, as, uh, as, uh, that's as serious as a heart attack in comparison to the absurdity of evolution. It's a mythology of this age that makes the Greek and Roman gods and the Egyptian gods worshiping bulls and look wonderful as the most intellectually uplifting thing you could do. I mean, it is so stupid and so incredibly dumb that, that the, you know, it, it, well, it, you know, I don't know what lies in the future, but if people become intelligent again, they are going to look back on this age as an age of darkness. This will be the new dark age. What God and the angels of God think about the ignorance and stupidity of human beings in this time, I, I just can't even think about. But that's, you know, it's St. Paul says, you know, that with itching ears, they will turn to fables and so forth. Uh, and uh, implying that they will lose the faith. In other words, that, that it's not just that they will, you know, continue in, in the idiocy of paganism, but it, there's, there's a, in that, that encyclical or that uh, epistle, there's, an, uh, there's um, no, I think it's the gospel. It's the gospel. Uh, that it's our Lord, yes. The, uh, that they will turn away from the faith. You know, and, uh, so, uh, and evolutionism is very much a part of it. And everyone believes in evolution. If you say you don't believe in evolution, the mouth drops down and, and the eyes bug out. And, and how could you not believe it? Everybody believes in evolution. So it's the new dogma, it's a new religion. We'll see why. So Charles Darwin was born in Shrewsbury. That's how they say that. Shropshire. All right. In England on the 12th of February, 1809. That's also Lincoln's birthday, but I think Lincoln was a little older than that. At his family home at Mount House. He was the fifth of six children of wealthy society. This is from Wikipedia. Or it's one of those things. Uh, uh, of wealthy society, Dr. Robert Darwin and Susanna Darwin, nay Wedgwood, the famous company that made beautiful china, or actually ceramic stuff. I don't know if she was related, but Wedgwood was a very famous name in England. He was the grandson of Erasmus, notice the name, Darwin on his father's side, and of Josiah Wedgwood on his mother's side, both from the prominent English Darwin Wedgwood family, which supported the Unitarian Church. The Unitarians were the, well, they were called Unitarians because they denied the Trinity. They were the early woke people. In other words, uh, the uh, progressives in religion and naturalist religion and rationalistic religion. It's the Unitarians. Trinity of... You know, can't think of the Trinity. So they were Unitarians. That's why they're called Unitarians. They're still around. <clears throat> so you can see he comes from a left-wing background. That, that's He didn't come from high church Anglicanism, let's put it that way. In 1825, after spending the summer as an apprentice doctor helping his father with treating the poor of Shrups... Shropshire. <clears throat> Darwin went to Edinburgh University to study medicine, but his revulsion at the brutality of surgery led him to neglect his medical studies. <clears throat> he learned taxidermy. Does everyone know what that is? Oh, stuffing dead animals. Yes. Is it the same thing in French? No. Spanish? Taxidermy? Hello. No, it's where you, you shoot an animal and then you stuff the head. What is that in Spanish? You put the head on, on, the, on the wall. 
They don't? Okay. No. It's no other Spanish. Who? You. You don't know the word for taxidermy in Spanish? You never had a stuffed animal? Did you ever shoot an animal and have it stuffed? No. no. Okay. Well, all right. We'll look up the word for taxidermy in Spanish. But so he studied taxidermy <coughs> from John Edmund Stone, a freed black slave who told him exciting tales of the South American of the South American rainforest. Uh, don't forget, at this time, this is when um, England f freed all the slaves in the British Empire and also took on a, um, a very anti-slavery position uh, and actually stopped the slave trade coming out of West Africa with ships. They, you, know, you couldn't get past the British. Yeah. So, they, they, uh, so that, that's just a footnote. In Darwin's second year, he became active in student societies for naturalists. He became an avid pupil of Robert Edmund Grant. All right, <clears throat> now, now watch him. He was born in Edinburgh, that's Scotland, having obtained his MD in Edinburgh, Edinburgh in 1814 and become a doctor. He gave up medical practice to become a specialist in marine biology and invertebrate zoology that means no backbone snakes and that sort of thing, Giving on a, living on a legacy from his father. As a materialist freethinker, see, so you see his Darwin's genealogy here, probably a deist and politically radical. <laughs> he was open to ideas in biology that were considered subversive in the repressive conservative climate of Britain in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. And it is notable that he cited in his doctoral thesis Erasmus Darwin's zoonomia, which means the uh, nomos in Greek means law. Zoos means life. So uh, the, uh, uh, or zoe, I think it is, zoe. So it means the law of life, essentially. A work notorious for evolution theory, foreshadowing Lamarck, who was a French evolutionist. Grant traveled widely, visiting universities in France, Germany, Italy, and Switzerland, and came into contact with the French zoologist Etienne Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, who espoused Lamarckian, the Lamarckian theory of evolution. So these are pre-Darwinian uh, pre evolutionists. Through acquired characteristics, Lamarck was actually the first evolutionist. Friends. <laughs> uh, so, so you see, his you know he's he becomes a, an avid pupil of Robert Edmund Grant. So that means he's learning all of this junk from from Robert Edmund Grant. All of the radicalism, everything he puts him on a pedestal. You always have to look into people's backgrounds, and you you can tell why they are what they are. Um, so, who champion the theories of uh, etc. Lamarck and uh, so uh, and Charles's grandfather Erasmus concerning evolution by acquired characteristics. So, before he went to the Galapagos Islands, he had this all in his head. He had a preconceived notion of evolution. He didn't discover that the finches, in fact, they evolved, and lo and behold. He had a preconceived notion. He had a history of it. Darwin took part in Grant's investigations of the life cycle of marine animals on the shores of the Firth of Forth, that's a bay in Scotland, which found evidence for homology, the radical theory that all animals have similar organs and differ only in complexity. So we're all the same thing. You and the cats are the same thing. You're just a little bit more complex, or they might be more complex than you. <clears throat> they know how to get three meals a day without even cooking. <laughs> That's pretty smart. They come in, they take over a human being's home, and then they get th three meals a day. They get you know, warmth and everything all for free. 
roof over their heads. Pretty nice. They sleep the whole day, play at night. Pretty smart animals. They get humans to do what they want them to do. They don't pay attention to them when you they get orders from humans. They just look the other way. Got to hand it to them. They might be far more advanced than we are. They probably understand every single thing we say. They just make believe they don't. <laughs> so in 1827, his father, unhappy that his younger son had no interest in becoming a physician, shrewdly enrolled him in a Bachelor of Arts course at Christ's College, University of Cambridge, to qualify as a clergyman. <clears throat> This was a sensible career move at a time when many Anglican parsons were provided with a comfortable income and when most naturalists in England were clergymen who, who saw it as part of their duties to explore the wonders of God's creation. <coughs> at Cambridge, Darwin preferred writing and shooting to studying. So he's not a deep intellectual He's not somebody that deeply studied science. Along with his cousin William Darwin Fox, he became engrossed in the craze at the time for the competitive collecting of beetles, little bugs. And Fox introduced him to the Reverend John Stevens Henslow, professor of botany for expert advice on beetles. Darwin subsequently joined Henslow's natural history course, became his favorite pupil, and came to be known as the man who walks with Henslow. <clears throat> when exams began, began to loom, Darwin focused more on his studies and received private instruction from Henslow. Darwin became particularly enthused by the writings of William Paley, including the argument of divine design in nature. In his finals in January 1831, he performed well in theology and having scraped through in classics, mathematics, and physics, came 10th out of a pass list of 178. But notice that in his physical sciences, he only scraped through. That means he barely made it. Residential requirements kept Darwin at Cambridge until June. In keeping with Henslow's example and advice, he was in no rush to take holy orders. Invalid, anyway. Inspired by Alexander von Humboldt's personal narrative, he planned to visit the Madeira Islands to study natural history in the, in the tropics with some classmates after graduation. To prepare himself, Darwin joined the geology course of the Reverend Adam Sedgwick, a strong proponent of divine design, then in the summer went with him to assist in mapping strata in Wales. That means levels of rock strata. Darwin was surveying strata on his own when his plans to visit Madeira were dashed by a message that his intended companion had died, but on his return home he received another letter. Henslow had recommended Darwin for the unpaid position of gentleman's companion to Robert Fitzroy, the captain of the HMS Beagle, on a two-year expedition to chart the coastline of South America, which would give Darwin valuable opportunities to develop his career as a naturalist. The uh, British always had a comfortable position with Chile, and they were always roaming around that side of South America. His father objected to the voyage, regarding it as a waste of time, but was persuaded by his brother-in-law, Josiah Wedgwood, to agree to his son's participation. The voyage became a five-year expedition that would lead to dramatic changes in many fields of science. Uh, you see that in that movie. I forget what's the name of that movie. Master and Commander. I think that's Darwin on that ship. When they go to the Galapagos Islands. Pretty sure. Anyway. As HMS Beagle surveyed the coasts of South America, Darwin began to theorize about the wonders of nature around him. The Beagle survey took five years, two-thirds of which Darwin spent exploring the, the, on land. He studied a rich variety of geological features, fossils, 
and living organisms and met a wide range of people, both native and colonial. He methodically collected an enormous number of specimens, many of them new to science. This established his reputation as a naturalist <clears throat> and made him one of the precursors of the field of ecology, particularly the notion of biosenensis. That means uh, the cohabitation of many different species in a particular place. His extensive detailed notes showed his gift for theorizing and formed the basis for his later work, as well as providing social, political, and anthropological insights into the areas he visited. <clears throat> Three native missionaries returned to the Beagle, to Tierra del uh, Fuego, which is at the bottom of South America, known for its rough seas, by the way, that, that cape. Uh, they had become civilized in England over the previous two years, yet their relatives appeared to Darwin to be miserable, degraded savages. Within a year, the missionaries had reverted to their harsh previous way of life, yet they preferred this and did not want to return to England. This experience, his <clears throat> detestation of the slavery he saw elsewhere in South America, and other problems he found about such as the effect of European settlement on Aborigines in New Zealand and Australia persuaded him that there was no moral justification for the mistreating of others based on the concept of race. He now thought that humanity was not as far removed from animals as his clerical friends believed. So here we go. We're all animals. So we're all equal because we're all animals. So, which, <laughs> no, it's not very complimentary to anybody. So that's Wikipedia. <clears throat> Charles Darwin is most closely associated with evolutionism, and rightly so, but we find his ideas already in the works of Lamarck at the beginning of the 19th century. He tried to explain the differences in animals by a progressive evolution from lower species to higher species. He said that this progress took place by means of the adaptation of the animal to its environment the transmission of these adaptations by heredity and habit resulting from the exercise or inertia of the organs and of the corresponding functions. <clears throat> See, it's not impossible that there be an adaptation to surroundings. It's probably true. And it's not impossible that those adaptations over a long period of time be transferred to genes and that the offspring have the adaptations. That doesn't make you a higher being. It just makes you a subspecies. So you, you might find you know, white bears in the, in the polar regions, and you find brown bears in, in other regions. You, you, uh, you find the, the Siberian tiger, which is white in, in Siberia, and then they're yellow in, in India. They're both tigers. So the, the adaptation, or you might find you know, some owl that is particular to a certain forest. That is not going from lower to higher. That's possible. Species means something that has a specific essence. Species is the intellectual word for essence. It means image. It's the image of the essence. Essence is something that is metaphysical and cannot be changed without changing the whole creature and can only be changed by God. So God could turn you into a frog if he wants, and then could turn you back into a human being because he has complete control of both your essence and existence. So he could poof you right into a frog if he wanted to right now. But no adaptation is going to poof you into a frog or poof a a fish into a frog because it's looking at the at the at the shore you know and it jumps out of the water oh there's a shore there he thinks i mean this is really sick this is like a cartoon or something In 1859, Darwin published his Origin of Species, in which he developed and completed the idea of Lamarck. Darwin added to Lamarck's theory the notion of natural selection. 
According to Darwin, national, national, uh, natural selection takes place when animals struggle for survival and the fittest among them wins and subsequently transmits the nature to, by heredity. That's also a lot of garbage. Because the more perfect animal does not necessarily survive. Usually the less perfect animal survives. That's why we have so many crows out here. Those dirty little things. There's sparrows and common things survive more than perfect things. Thoroughbred horses have to be bred. There's, a, if anything, a downward slope of, of survival. And there's the, the, it's not an uplifting. There's not a, a greater perfection that goes on. It, it goes down. And usually the more perfect things are more vulnerable. You know, how much do you pay for a thoroughbred horse or for a purebred dog? Would people pay for some dogs? It's unbelievable. For a dog. Uh, but those things have to be bred. They, they have to be carefully selected. <laughs> but th th there's a, usually a downward movement in, in natural selection. Whoever's got the, you know, beat up somebody else. You know, it, it, it doesn't improve the species. So, th thus the great variety of species of both plant and animal life is the result for Darwin of a process of natural selection and adaptation to environment. It all started with a single primordial life form. So as Father Chicago called, that's the lightning hitting the mud puddle. The, the, uh, th this is what they say, you know, you had this, this, you know, again, there's not even a number of years you can put on this. I mean, we don't have words that describe the number of years on this. So you had uh, these pools of amino acids, which are, you might say, building blocks of life forms. And then the lightning came. Wow, 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 wham, wham. And then... And then poof, you've got amoebas. Well, that's as absurd. The, the amino acid is as far from an amoeba as a pile of bricks is from a house. So it'd be the same as saying, well, there's a pile of bricks out there, and then a the light, wham, wham, wham. Of course, a trillion years of wham, wham, and then you have a house. This is what we're supposed to believe. We can't recite the Nicene Creed, Credo and Unum Deum. Oh, that's absurdity. That's, that's you know, that, that's, you know, that, that, you know, we can't believe, well, who believes that stuff? But we're supposed to believe this garbage. This is the Credo that we have to recite. As you can see, uh, evolution makes me go a little crazy. The <laughs> so, Darwin never said that this process was responsible for the origin of life. He did not deny creation, uh, but he eventually became a, an atheist. Da nonetheless, Darwin was a materialist, which is the same thing. According to him, the interpretation of dreams, hallucinations of the imagination, and other similar phenomena gave man the idea of spirits, which in turn served as a premise for the idea of God. So it all comes from your dreams. See? Not evolution. That doesn't come from your imagination. No, no, no. <laughs> Thus the great variety of... Uh, no, so uh, the moral law, which implies an essential distinction between vice and virtue, between good and evil, is a simple transformation of the social instinct of animals brought about by natural selection. So you see how this is dominant, you know, the idea that there's no such thing as a natural law. Who recently said that? The natural law, that was, it was, uh, I 
forget his name. There is no way of acting based on nature as the moral law. See, it's all just social instinct of animals. So if you have an instinct, see, so if you identify with a woman, if you wake up in the morning and think, I'm a woman, then you go have yourself transformed into a woman. Just like that thing in, in uh, Pennsylvania that now has become the, some sort of national health figure who's just an old guy with long hair. He became a woman. It, it's the most absurd creature you've ever seen. The, so that's, there's no nature. It's all just your impulse. Okay. It, it has tremendous influence. There's an old saying, ideas rule the world. There's any false morality, any sort of, it's just like, you know, World War II was brought on by an idea. All of that, you know, those, all those people perishing and all the bombs, everything like that was brought by an idea. I mean, the, the unbelievable losses and, and uh, unhappiness of, that, of those five years was because of ideas. What the ideas floating in people's heads. You know, like Japan deciding it was going to build an empire in the East. That comes from people's heads. And then getting the idea that somehow it was going to defeat the United States. That was the crazy military, militarists in Japan. And that the crazy idea that the United States would not respond to the, to the Pearl Harbor. That was another crazy idea in their heads. And that they were going to march this is what they said from California to Washington and take over Washington. This is the, the, the ideas in their heads. And you know how that ended. You know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But ideas rule the world. And they make either a, a great world or havoc. But it's very important to study ideas. You know, they, they, it all comes from somebody's idea, either good or bad. All the, the misery of human life or all of the joy of human life or you know, the, the, what is right or wrong about human life comes from the, somebody's head. And they spread it around for good or for, for worse. So that's, that's why philosophy is very important. All of this is very important. Ah. All right.